Well, with Anzac Day just passing, I uh, was interested to have a think about the world wars, and uh, I'm pretty slow on the uptake, but uh, Joss and Haley have Netflix, and uh, I'm slow. I've never even had a wander around Netflix, and I'm looking at it the other uh, night, and I, I found this incredible documentary on uh, World War II. Anyone seen that, where they took all the black and white footage, the actual raw historical footage, and they coloured it? So you're watching, I've watched a couple of them, and um, you're just learning this incredible documentary from the actual raw footage of what happened. And it, it, the war, World War II culminated in the Allied invasion of Normandy. D-Day, 1944. It was a massive operation. An overwhelming array of factors needed to come together for success. Hundreds of ships, thousands of planes, hundreds of amphibious landing craft without a clear strategy, without a clearly defined agenda. There's no way that the Allies could have ever successfully executed that invasion. As we read our Bibles and reflect on world history, we see a clear agenda from our Father God. He is no warmonger, but he knows how to defeat the enemy, which is death and the devil. He actually has a clear strategy for his people, his tool to bring hope where there is despair. And his tool used to be Israel, and then Jesus came and fulfilled everything that Israel was meant to accomplish, and then through the death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit was sent, well, we became the church. We became the tool that God would use to defeat the problem of evil, to defeat the evil one, to fix what was broken, and he is using the church by the power of the Spirit, to bring justice where there is oppression, life where there is death. And it's all for the glory of Jesus. He actually has a clear strategy. It's, uh, it's not the strategy we would pick. If I was picking the way to solve the problem of evil in the world, to rescue the world, I would, I would sort of do it from high above, wouldn't you? Like, you know, like a satellite, <laughs> But God actually came down and showed his strategy. He would become part of the mess. And that's what we've been called to be part of. Amen? We've been called to be part of the knit and grit and, and dirt of life, but to be God's agent of hope in that. That's what world mission is about. So throughout May at Hornsby Baps, we want to be studying what God's agenda is, his missionary heart for the nation at nations and to grapple with what that means for us. God has a clear strategy. So I want to um, communicate from a bunch of verses and reflections on history three things. Firstly, God's agenda is for the nations. Secondly, God's agenda is not naturally our agenda. And revelation is the agenda changer. God's agenda is for the nations. God's agenda is not naturally our agenda. And revelation is the agenda changer. Now, agenda, what is agenda? Well, agenda is just like a list of priorities. If I have an agenda, sometimes it's not revealed clearly, but it's what I'm trying to achieve. What is God's to-do list? Not a bad question to ask, don't you reckon? Like, what is God on about? He's sovereign, no one can thwart his plan, so it's a really good idea for us to work out what is he doing in history, what's he doing right now in my life? How can I line myself up for what he's doing? Well, God's agenda is for the nations. He wants to take his name's renown to every nation. God wants to glorify himself. Amen? Is he stuck up if he wants to do that? Like, is that wrong? Is that sort of proud? Is it okay for God to want to glorify himself? 
What do you reckon? You see, it must be. God must glorify himself because who else would he glorify? There's no one in all the universe who deserves glory. But it's more than that. When we rightly line up our affections and that which we would worship in life, when we rightly line that up and go, wow, God, creator of all things, Father, giver of my Savior, Jesus, giver of the Holy Spirit, when, <coughs> when I worship that God, it's good for me. It's a good thing to put God as number one, and that's his agenda. He wants to take his name's renown to all nations, but he's a loving and good God. And when he knows that he takes his name's renown to all the nations on the earth, they receive his love, and it's all good for them. That's what God is on about, and you, you see that so clearly from Scripture. Trinity read for us, this amazing passage, just before Jesus went back to heaven, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a big statement, isn't it? All authority. I'm going to achieve this. All authority has been given to me. This is Jesus talking. Therefore, disciples, go and make disciples of who? Every nation, every group that calls us, us and them, them, every ethnos, every family of nations who defines themselves with a, a cultural heritage, God says, I, I want to reach every one of them and I'm going to use you, Motley Crew Church. I'm going to use you. Go out and don't just evangelize. Don't just tell them about me, how to get into heaven. Teach them how to live. Disciple them. Bring them into Trinitarian reality. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is another amazing insight into what God's agenda is. Jesus says this to his disciples. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. What is the gift? The gift of the Father is the Spirit. The gift of the Father is the Spirit. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is Acts 2. This is Pentecost. And what happened in that amazing moment when the place shook and the sound of the wind and the tongues of fire came on them, what happened when the gift of the Father came into the church? They spoke in the tongues of nations. What is God's agenda? Right there, we know it is. He goes, I want, <coughs> excuse me, I want my glory to go to the nations. To the nations. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I guess I'm just trying to make an argument from Scripture. God has an agenda, and it's for the nations. Um, who, who's doing, oh, you don't have to raise your hands, no judgment. But anyone? Give me a little wink if you're doing the 30 days through the Bible. It's heaps of winks. Heaps of winks. Um, what, it, it's a really good thing to do. It will raise all sorts of questions when you start reading the Bible. But you will find, I think it was day 4, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Right at the start, when God was calling this nobody, Abram, he said, I will bless you that you will be a blessing to who? All ethnos, all nations. This is like Missiology 101, and it's so important to know it. Often no one gets taught this in church. Wow, this is too clear. And what happens if you cheat and you skip to the end of the Bible? What happens in the very end? Well, check out Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. The apostle John is on the island of Patmos. He's got a vision of the end. So, you know, you cheat. You go to the end of the book and go, what happened? After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Where did they come from? Every nation. 
tribe, people and language. Standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to his Lamb, the one who saved all these people. When Jesus walked the earth, he said, This is my mission, to seek and save that which was lost. Is it a fair argument? It's a fair argument. I mean, really, I mean, you spend a lot more time reading the middle part, but God is interested in the nations for his glory and for their good. But, you know, God's agenda is not naturally our agenda. Have you ever found that in life? Like, like even now, honestly, I want to get inside your head a bit. Are you interested in what I'm saying or are you bored? Now, just th- feel what's going on inside you. Have you already checked out? Because I've just been doing a survey of Scripture of the God who created the universe who we're really stoked that if we're Christians, we're going to be with forever, worshipping and taking all the good stuff from him. We're just hearing his agenda and I want you to wonder what just happened in your heart and mind. Were you sitting there going, oh, what am I having later for dinner? Yeah. When's he going to finish? Oh, no, when's Like, honestly, that's for you and God to think about. I could easily bore you, but the content's better than that. The content's God's agenda. So I want to ask you, what is it that happened just in that moment maybe for you? But extrapolate that out over a life and you find whole generations who don't care about God's agenda for the nations. You know, as I reflect on it, I think one of the problems we have is we're just really busy, aren't we? We're just really busy. I didn't live 200 years ago. I don't know how busy they were, but like pushing a plough behind a bullock or something, it doesn't seem so busy. We have access to all the information you could possibly want in all the world. Let me ask you a question. Is anyone busy? Anyone busy? Like, I reckon you've got to actually work hard at not being busy. Is that fair to say? Like you've got to steal it back. <clears throat> you, because it's just busy. Like, you know, we want to be successful. There's stuff to be done. And uh, you know, we, we've had kids. We have four kids and they're amazing and they're here. But we know what it's like to spend 20-something years raising kids. It's just busy. And there's not, it's not about sin. It's just like... Busy in Sydney, mums and dads are both working, right? To pay bills they can't afford, mortgages that have gone up really high, kids are in daycare, school, off to extracurricular activities. I know that's mainly not you guys, but it won't be long before you're in that. Who would have thought? You'd be married and got kids and looking through Bunnings for Nilex hoses. That's the future, guys. That's the future, no matter how wide-eyed you are about mission. You've got to buy a hose at some point. But grandparents, you know, I see it in people's eyes this morning. They're running on the wheel like mouse, mice. They're, they're running around and, or oh, they're getting a well-deserved break. They've gone hard all their life and, you know, no one's pouring judgment. So they're like, you know, I'll be waiting for the trip and, and we're going to go do it and we've been looking forward to it and we've been saving and, and, and praise God, I want to do that. <laughs> There's just stuff to be done or we're securing this little safe, Aussie, sacred thing called the castle. We're making our castle safe from terrorists. And, and, you know, most of us who've got a brain, we go, you know, in Sydney, if you do a renovation on your house, like it sort of gives you back stuff. Like, so it's not a bad financial thing to do. So, so we sort of feather the nest and, and, and it keeps us busy. What's it like for a young adult? Well, it may not be your story, but those who are 40s, 50s, 60s, often their health goes downhill and all of a sudden their busyness is going to doctor's appointments or it's taking their parents to doctor's appointments or suddenly you've got kids and those kids have made bad decisions in life and you're there for them and you're juggling. It's called the sandwich time in life. And, and, but what is it for you guys? So you guys? Some of you guys have got your whole lives ahead of you. Maybe. 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 I love that line. The old evangelistic line was, um, if you were to die tonight, 
how would you live? Is that what they say? Yeah. If you, is that what they say? Evangelist? If you were to die tonight, where would you sort of go? When my dad dropped dead and I got a phone call from my brother saying, Dad's dead, I suddenly changed that and I preached a few messages where I said, if you were to die before the end of the service, how would you be with God? And that sounds awful to say that, but we actually don't know, do we, how long we've got to live. One thing we all know is this, there are no trailers behind hearses. No trailers. I've seen heaps of hearses as a pastor. The hearses carry, carry coffins. It's been said, only what's done for Christ will last. It's only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What are you doing with God's agenda? In the busyness. You know, the funny thing about mission is um, there's this pocket of time, I think, that you can step out and grab hold of world mission, foreign mission. Because as soon as you get your training done, you, you're on a pathway, aren't you? You're, you're on an ambitious pathway. And there are these little times, where, and tonight might be one of them, honestly, for you, where God just gets to speak something into your heart. And it's not that you should drop the dream, but just to hold it up with God's agenda and go, do they match? Can I use what I'm passionate about to give glory to God? And could I maybe be part of God's passion to reach the nations? You know, if we look at the Bible, it's not hard to see. The pattern of losing God's agenda is everywhere. Moses. Think of Moses. God comes to Moses and basically says, Moses, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to be my mouthpiece. I'm going to liberate the people of Israel from the bondage of of Pharaoh and, and the Egyptians. It's going to be the biggest story ever for the people of Israel for thousands of years. They're going to look back on that Exodus moment. Mate, you don't know how it's going to pan out, but I want you to be my mouthpiece. This is my agenda. I want to liberate my people. And Moses says what? I don't know if I'd be your guy. I don't don't really like public speaking. And God's there scratching his head going, which part of that wasn't sort of enormously exciting? Which part? God goes to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to take the message of judgment, but also my grace, my love to Nineveh. What does Jonah do? He just runs in the opposite direction. He's like, no, no, my agenda is different to yours, God's. God, I, I don't want to do that. I, there, there's a deep underlying worldview for most of us that world mission is someone else's issue. Don't you reckon? Is that fair to say? Like someone else. I wonder if the world was you, would you reach the world? If, if, if every Christian was you or me, would we have any hope, would God have any hope of reaching the world? That sounds very judgmental because we need a team. But what is this about thinking, well, it, it's, it's always someone else. It's those special, those special missionaries, those hardcore, you know, called ones. But the funny thing is, if you are a missionary, cross-cultural worker, and you've been called to go, it's not even as though we, we make them out to be heroes. I think I've told you this story before, but a friend of ours, they, they were going to the mission field 12 or 13 years ago, and they're going around, the final say goodbyes and rallying support. And they were four kids, and they just had their fifth child. And they were leaving to go to Mozambique, the Yao, starting the Yao work, um, and Josiah, their youngest, was going to be 10 weeks old when they jumped on the plane. Mozambique's one of the poorest countries in the world. And Jono says to me, you know what gutted me is when someone from one of these churches comes up to me and says, mate, I don't know how, it's really serious, I don't know how you can take your, <coughs> excuse me, so I don't know how you can take five children to a place as dangerous as Mozambique. And then he says this as a little kicker, he says, I love my kids too much to do that. And jono has got tears in his eyes when he says, mate, I'm not going because I don't love my kids. I'm going because the love of Christ compels me to go. Amen. I'm going because there's something even transcending the love I have for my kids. That's crazy, serious commitment. And we watch those guys come close to death and kids getting malaria and, oh, they've had a tough time. But 
the only reason Heather and Tobias Houston are there is because Jono and Heather went there as pioneers and started a beachhead and then they came back and people like Toby and Heather got inspired. They went on a short-term trip from Gosford over there, got inspired, and now they're over there full-time. Now they're over there full-time. What's God saying to you about mission? Is it just for the full-on hardcore crazies? Well, at, at, at this church, um, we've had, we've had a, I guess, a really uh, amazing history with mission. We've actually sent out, we as in the church, we've sent out lots of missionaries. I keep hearing about it. Someone we support and they said, oh, they were part of our church. And I think, wow, how cool is that? But my sense is just now we're at a low ebb. Like right now, I don't get the feeling that the mission is just like, Pfft. is that fair to say? World mission? So I wonder, does God want to use us, this generation? Does he want to do something in, in this season of church life at Hornsby Baptist? And you know what? We're just new kids on the block. We've been here for nine months. So we're just, just coming as well and thinking, well, what's God going to do? Throughout history, it's clear that ambivalence to world mission doesn't get changed by well-meaning discussion. It just doesn't. It doesn't get changed by fancy videos. That that can help. It gets changed from, by a spiritual revelation that God gives to people. He puts a burning passion. He rekindles something in their heart. They just reach out, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. They just have an inkling. They move towards God's heart, and God goes, I see that here. Here's a picture. You can intercede. You can stand in that gap. You can feel my heart, why I love the nations, why the church has to be mobilized. Here, feel it. And it just takes one person, like the, the cranes, who said, we're going. And God does a movement. He starts something special. So I want to talk about that. Revelation is the agenda changer to finish. Matthew 16 is a verse that is good to lock away in your memory banks. Matthew 16, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, what's the question? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because who you say I am matters. Who do you think I am, Peter? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's a good answer, Peter. And this wasn't revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And on this, I can build my church. And the Catholics would say, that's the Peter, the man, and the Pope comes in a line after that. Us Protestants would say, no, no, it's not quite that. We don't exactly know, but I believe it's the revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Christ. When you understand the revelation of who Jesus is, God can build a church on that. Amen. Who Jesus is matters so much. Jesus said to Peter, <clears throat> I'll build a church on a revelation like that. And you know what? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell holding people back. It's like the church going into Mozambique, to the Yao, to an unreached people group. Boom. Prayer. Gospel. Prayer. Gospel. Sacrifice. The gates of hell smashed open. They will not prevail against the unstoppable power of the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're on about. That's what we get excited about. God breaking down the barriers because this is his whole agenda. We're going to be with him in heaven forever. Those of us who love Jesus and have received his grace. Who is it at Hornsby? Who is it at Hornsby that, that God is going to raise up like John R. Mott? Anyone heard of John R. Mott? John R. Mott, no one even knows about him now. He's, he was used by God really significantly. He's a young man, 1800s, and he's seeking God. He's praying. He's reading his Bible. And he's at university, and he hears a speech by a guy called J. Kiniston Studd. Anyone heard of C.T. Studd? I read a book about him. It's his brother. So Jake Kiniston Studd, he's just doing a talk. That's why I prayed honestly, God, do something. Because Jake Kiniston Studd, he just was talking. He's no different than me or you. He's just a bloke. He was just talking at a university and he says three sentences that grabbed hold of John R. Mott as a young university student. And they were just these. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And God took that 
put it inside John R. Mott as a seed and said, John, I want you to do that. I want you to do that. So he gets this rekindled flame in his heart, passionate about the gospel and the nations. He goes on to serve for over 50 years with the YMCA, gives his life to student mobilisation to foreign mission. Two years after that, that word that he got, <clears throat> he gets another revelation from God to start a new organisation. It's called the Student Volunteer Movement for Foreign Missions. And this John R. Mott is super pragmatic. He's super practical. He says, you know what? I'm just thinking if God's agenda is for the nations and we're the rich people, why don't we just, he's talking to university students, he says, why don't we get on board? <clears throat> so why don't, since we're rich, why don't two of us, we get groups of three, two stay at home in the West and earn as much money as we can to send the third person overseas to the world, to foreign mission. And you know what happened? Tens of thousands of students were mobilised for foreign mission. That's the power of a revelation. That's the power of someone going, I want to be part of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about how we could do this to reach the world for Christ, to be part of God's big agenda, William Carey. He began mission to India through a revelation, Hudson Taylor to China, Adoniram Judson to Borneo, and so many, so many women. It takes revelation. So the question I want to leave you with, we're not quite at the end yet, but is what's the radical minimum standard for Christianity? What's the radical minimum standard? Is there a dichotomy between a fully consecrated life for Christ and a sort of consecrated life? Well, not really, but it's like going to heaven at least. And so many of us go, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I am not full on. Like, I'm not crazy, like those fully consecrated people. But the weird thing is, last week we were looking at Galatians, and Galatians says it's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. For all of us, for all of us as Christians. I think over the years as I reflect on it, I think you need a bunch of friends in Christian community to keep thinking, what's the radical minimum standard for people in their 20s? How can we do this well? And then as you get older, you, you, you look at what's going on around you and, and you pour grace over your life. You don't go around judging people. You, you're gracious to one another and you go, you know what, we don't live in the developing world. We live here, so you know, it's different. But what's the radical minimum standard? What's, what, what does life look like as Christians who are really passionate about what God is doing in the world? In, uh, in 2005, John O'Crane and his wife, they, they got in touch with us. We knew them for about five years and they said, hey, why don't you come over? You guys, because we went, Leanne and I went to Bible college to become missionaries overseas. And uh, I always thought the pastors were backslidden. I thought, you know, they take the easy job. Everyone should go to the mission field. And, um, and then God really convicted me and said, you don't have a heart for your own people. And um, so we ended up staying here. We, we served 20 years, at 19 years at, at one place and, and have certainly had a heart for mission. And, but 2005 comes along and it pricked our hearts. And with tears and prayer and, and dialogue with mentors, we thought, is this God saying, pick it up? I know your kids are at varied places in their schooling, but start working towards getting out there and maybe going to Mozambique. And um, so I found it scary because I'm like, I've heard how hard it is for you, mate. I don't know if I want to do that. But, you know, we grappled with it. And to be honest, we really felt like God said, I've called you to be mobilisers. I've called you to mobilise people. And uh, I remember so clearly sitting at the kitchen table um, at midnight, often where God speaks to you, four in the morning or midnight, anyone, like odd times. And I felt like God said, I want you to be part of seeing me raise up an Isaiah 6 generation at Caring Bar. And Isaiah 6 is that passage where Isaiah has this encounter with God and sees his holiness and God says, who shall I send? to take my message of love to the world. And what does Isaiah say in Isaiah 6? Here I am. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. That's not what Jonah did. 
That's not what Abraham did. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Because he says, oh, okay, I could use you. It won't be easy. So I felt like God put this idea in my heart, the GI6 gener- um, network, which was Generation Isaiah 6. And we shared it with um, Global Interaction at the time, and they said, that's a great idea, and they nicked off with it, <clears throat> and they created a thing called GI6 Pro, which is about mobilising young adults. And I don't know if they still do it, but we took this idea to the church, and um, we said, 2006, 2005, just like this, in May Mission Month, and we said, hey, could we ever create a network of senders who are happy to, to pledge money over the next two years so that if there's any Isaiahs among us who say, here I am, send me, we'd already have the money. We'd already, I told you about it before. So <clears throat> we didn't know what would happen and uh, we, we had you know, the studies on mission at the end of it not only did we raise money for projects we were doing, we had 102 people pledge $70,000 over two years. And it took ages before anyone took the money up, but sooner or later someone applied and we looked at their application and we said, you know what, that's, that's fair. They needed 1500 bucks, And so I wrote a letter out to 102 people and said, could you bring in a percentage of what you said that you'd give? All we need is about 10% or 5%. Within two days we had $1,500. Bang, done, ticket bought. And I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. This could work. And just this week when I was reflecting on this idea of us getting amongst that, I felt like God said, hey, um, don't feel proud about it, mate, because I opposed the proud. I went, yes, Lord, no, it's not me. I give glory to you. And And I'm reflecting on it. In 2005, we hadn't sent a missionary at Caring Bar out for about 25 years. And I think there'd been one or two short-term trips. It was a diabolical sort of dearth, just dusty um, soil of mission. When we prayed and put energy and passion behind mobilisation for God's glory, God just went, and I'm not exaggerating, in the next 10 years, that church has sent out hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds and hundreds of people in short-term trips doing all sorts of things, now multiple people are long-term. Not only that, they've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. I was trying to think if it was a million, it may not be a million, but so much money for mission. It's not funny. I, I, I look back and I think, wow, wow. I know the same God is our God. Amen? Like the same God is our God. He never wants stuff to just stay stale. All he's looking for is a few hearts that go, yeah. We'll pray. We're in. We'll pledge. We, we want to be part of this. And the other really cool thing happened that when I reflect on it, we had hundreds of people join the church. And when we talked to them later, why have you come? They said, we're here because of the mission, strategy and heart of the church. Isn't that interesting? That people will come to a generous church. People who, who are Christians, who are looking for a church, we found, would go... Yeah, if you're into the spirit, word, and action, deed, we want to be part of that. It's really hard to find a church that's not scared of the spirit or the word. All we want to be is a balanced church that's super generous and believes God's heart is for the nations. And we just watch people come in. And what I love was that were good people. They were leaders. They were people that want to be part of a church and they put skin in the game and the shoulder to the wheel. And suddenly that church really expanded in what God was doing through it. And I look at churches that don't grow and I think, what is it? Is it just because God sovereignly rolls a dice and says, I've got 400 churches, I want to bless three? I think God loves it when a church says, we want you, Lord. We want to be part of the action. What can we do? And uh, at Hornsby Baps, we are right on the, on the edge, maybe, of something really special. Maybe we get a shiny new church in two and a half years. But I promise you that is not enough. That shiny church is not enough. And the great danger we have at this church is that maybe we get into it without having to spend a dollar. And we just rock up, ambivalent, and go, isn't this nice? We've got a brand new church. God wants us to have skin in the game. He does. God's agenda is for the nations. Just 
Uh, any chance, Han, you could just put up as we finish that uh, Revelation 7 passage? Again, if you just wonder what happens at the end, like it's, it's fully okay to cheat, go to the end of the Bible and see who wins. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. He gets his bride. He gets his bride. I don't know what God's told you, but when I was about 22, I was praying. We were praying and fasting, just about to get married at the end of the year. I said, God, I had this opportunity to be in advertising. Great opportunity that came up. Should I go into pastoral ministry? You know, get trained for the mission field. I'm fasting. This is a five-day fast, I think it was. And in the middle of that fast... A guy rang me up out of the blue and gave me this job offer and also at a radio station because I'd done an advertising diploma and I was working in advertising. And I just felt like God said, Jono, it's up to you, mate. I'll bless you running an advertising agency or preaching the gospel. Honestly, either choice is fine. Is he saying that to you? Because some of you guys, God is saying, don't go to Bible college. I want you to run an amazing advertising agency with great integrity. I want you to be a salesman to the glory of God. I want you to be a teacher. I want... But some of us, he's saying, no, that won't last forever, but I want you to do this in the church. I want you to give yourself full time for what that agenda is. I'm going to shut up and let God speak to you. Let's just bow our heads and let God talk to us. Father in heaven, Lord, a lot of words just came out of my mouth and I just am so aware that I am a saint who sins regularly and I grapple with what the radical minimum standard is and in so many ways I speak out of hypocrisy. But Lord, I thank you that you won't let that stop your word going out. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, that you'd forgive us where we've just totally neglected your voice. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you just keep on gently inviting us to play our part. For some of us, we've got no idea how you've gifted us. Thanks for the mystery in life. Thanks for the adventure we have. Thanks that we can have confidence that you'll guide us in your perfect timing. Lord, I pray that you'd rekindle in our hearts a passion for your name. That we could see Jesus high and lifted up and the things of this earth that grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May that be our testimony as a church here. Lord, if you want to keep us small or whatever, it, it's fine. But Lord, may we be healthy. May we be a sender church. May we be a fruitful church. Lord, let other churches and other mission agencies and places grow we don't have to grow, but Lord, we want to be senders. We want to be fruitful. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the gardener and you also cause the fruit. It's all for you. It's all to your glory. Thank you, Lord Holy Spirit, that you've spoken to some of us tonight. And I pray that those seeds wouldn't be snatched away by any birds in the name of Jesus. May they find good soil and in time bear a crop a hundredfold. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.